welcome everybody. Uh, we're gathered here just ahead of the inaugural India Giving Day, um, which is scheduled for March 2nd, 2023. Yeah, each of us represented here is a participating organization in this inaugural endeavor. Very exciting time where we're seeing a whole host of India-focused nonprofits coming together for the first time. Uh, really coalescing about around the issue of India's overall development and galvanizing philanthropy and community involvement uh, in this important endeavor. Um, so with me uh, today are uh, Kamal Bawa from the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, uh, Jay Segal with the Segal Foundation, um, and uh, Nishant Pandey with the American India Foundation. So thank you to each of you for being here. And uh, with that, I will um, just, uh, you know, go ahead and uh, start with why we're here today, which is, like I said, India Giving Day, but really the fulcrum of why our organizations are gathering is because uh, it is our work around livelihoods uh, that really brings us together. And um, for HelpAge, uh, I, sorry, I should have mentioned, I am Sumani Dash, I'm the Managing Director of American Friends of HelpAge India. And um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit set up here in the US to really support the work being done by HelpAge India, a 44 year old organization, um, which really works on the cause of disadvantaged elders. And uh, we've been doing this across 26 states through various interventions. And one of our programs focuses on livelihood. Um, so I know, you know, for all of us, we're working on different elements of the livelihoods equation and the question of sustainability and, you know, how to generate livelihoods for such a vast majority of population, so many that are underserved and marginalized as well. And I know each of our organizations doing really important work. Uh, so with that background, I'd love to first invite uh, Jay Segal of the Segal Foundation to just give us a little background about Jay the Segal Foundation, your work on livelihoods and how that relates to India Giving Day. Uh, thanks, Samani. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and thank you for giving this opportunity. I, first of all, I think this is a great initiative uh, by the India Philanthropy Alliance to uh, for the India Giving Day. And uh, there's a lot of activities happening and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, initiative and, um, and progress is for the first year novel. I think the progress is amazing. So just uh, quickly on the Segal Foundation. Segal Foundation works in uh, rural India. Uh, for the past 23 years working on working with the very, very poor farmers uh, on, on agriculture practices, enhancing their agriculture practices. That's uh, if you if you look at the rural India, the only source of income is that small piece of land uh, they own. And um, and as, if we look at the overall numbers, uh, not, uh, not to get into too many numbers, almost 60 percent of India's population in one way or the other is associated with uh, agriculture. And many of those people actually resides in the rural communities where they are working on half an acre, one acre type of land. And to enhance the income of those people, is the key aspect of the Segal Foundation, what we work on, working with these uh, poor farmers on how do we enhance the income. You look at the poverty eradication or poverty uh, reduction, whatever you want to call it, is, is in, the, in that particular region that one needs to address the issues. The farmers in the rural communities, they, they face tremendous issues on um, not having the availability of good seed, not having availability of knowledge, uh, of uh, good fertilizers, what type of uh, uh, usage of these uh, equipments they need to use, as well as biggest issue is the water availability in these rural communities. So how do you address all these issues? is what Segal Foundation does in these rural communities, work learning from the communities, learning from these farmers as what their exact needs are and addressing the needs accordingly on those particular part uh, on those particular aspects in, in the rural community, in the in the poor with the poor farmers. Uh, water, as I said, is a huge issue uh, in, uh, you know, it's for the, where the water availability is there. The farmers are progressing, but the many, many places there's uh, hardly any water availability. 
So that's that's the other aspect that uh, impacts the livelihoods of the poor farmers in the in the villages. So working on those aspects, that's what the uh, vision of the Segal Foundation is to work in these rural communities on enhancing the income, enhancing the uh, uh, enhancing the uh, livelihoods in the in these uh, in these villages. Wonderful. And uh, did you just want to touch upon India Giving Day um, and why you're all participating? Oh, yes, India Giving Day. Well, it is. Uh, first of all, as I earlier mentioned, it's a, it's a great initiative uh, for all of us to come together. I mean, we see some of the very, very prominent organizations working in uh, in India. AIF is here, ATRI is here, our, um, our Prathams and, um, you know, you name it, every organization, Akanksha, it, it's coming together. I mean, that's the, that's the biggest thing that uh, that's the um, that's the unity that we bring together. Together. You know, we work, we cannot continue to work in silos. We have to unite and work together. I think India Giving Day brings that platform. Many times we get very uh, protected about our donors, our people, and, and we work in those silos. But here is an opportunity of all of us as coming together. I think there's going to be a tremendous learning, tremendous uh, uh, from this first inaugural session. And I th I believe, I think it will grow. My, my feeling is it, it will grow. Grow as we as we learn from this and in, continue to improve it for the future. So we are very very pleased to be part of this initiative and and helping each other uh, grow together. Wonderful. Well, very nicely put. And uh, with that, I'll segue to Nishant. If you wanted to weigh in on American India Foundation, tell us more about your livelihoods work and involvement with India Giving Day. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sumani. Um, we are exactly half the age as Help Age India. So we were created 22 years back uh, at the uh, suggestion of the then Indian Prime Minister Atul Bihari Vajpayee and at the initiative of President Clinton at that time as a collective philanthropic bridge between the two largest democracies. Both leaders felt that it was a necessity in the way um, at a time when the uh, relationship between the two countries was evolving in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, our mission is very simple. Our mission is to empower underprivileged women, children, and youth in India and do it in a way that it strengthens the U.S.-India partnership. We believe that uh, poverty in India, or for that matter globally, is multidimensional. And therefore, we work on health, education, and livelihoods, the three most you know, basic, most immediate needs of people living in poverty. Over the last uh, 20 years, we have impacted more than 13 million lives uh, across 35 uh, states and union territories of India. We are a very proudly and deeply secular and apolitical organization, but we work very, very closely in everything that we do uh, with the governments, both the central government and also the state governments, which allows us to operate at scale and building very built in very strong sustainability uh, into all the programs that we do under livelihoods our focus has always been on how do we kind of address the twin challenge that india is facing uh, india as we all know is a highly highly young country more than half the population of india that is about 7 to 800 million people are below the age of 29 about 12 million people join workforce every year. And so how do we make sure that these young people are constructively, positively employed um, in the economic activity of India, not only to contribute to the economic well-being of the country and the society as a whole, but also to make sure that the demographic dividend that India has does not become a demographic uh, nightmare. And that's why I focus on... Uh, skilling and entrepreneurship for youth. Uh, the second challenge that we try and address from our uh, with our livelihoods work is the declining female workforce participation uh, in India, which is a very um, concerning and disturbing uh, pattern uh, for the last few years. Um, India, unfortunately, um, the rate is only 20%, which is the lowest of all so South Asian countries and lowest of all emerging economies. And when 50% of the Indian population 
is not constructively and positively engaged with the economy, obviously it has a huge impact on the GDP growth and things like that. So the focus of our livelihoods work is youth and women. Uh, and we look at both rural and urban, and more importantly, both organized and unorganized sector. Uh, India, uh, unfortunately, does not uh, generate formal sector jobs at the same rate as the population uh, that needs it. And therefore, entrepreneurship, self-employment is a very, very important source of livelihoods for millions and millions of people. And so that's the focus of our uh, work on livelihoods. We um, run two kind of umbrella programs uh, on livelihoods. One is called MAST, Market Aligned Skills Training. And the other one is called ABLE, Ability-Based Livelihoods Empowerment, which is skilling and employability program, but focused on persons with disability. And so these are two kind of umbrella initiatives under which everything that we do on livelihoods uh, sit. Uh, on IGD, uh, specifically, AIF uh, is one of the founding members of the India Philanthropy Alliance. And uh, I think Jay has already, I'm also the vice chair of, uh, of IPA. So I feel very, very proud and very happy uh, about the journey that we have covered in the last four or five years and reached a place where we felt confident of launching the inaugural India Giving Day. Uh, Jay has already talked about how it is important to bring all the India-focused charities together uh, to make sure that we are not operating in silos. But I think uh, there's another uh, reason uh, for me to be very motivated uh, about India Giving Day, which is that, you know, the scale and complexity of development challenges that India faces, India requires, despite all the progress and the resources that are available in the country, India requires global engagement. And, uh, you know, the diaspora engagement is a very, very important part of it, uh, not just financially, but also intellectually and, and in terms of technical assistance, diaspora can play a very, very important role in uh, uh, in supporting India's journey uh, to uh, uh, a developed country, right? And so that's where I think IGD comes in. One is, of course, about financial, you know, contributions, uh, but also just engagement, mm -hmm. the awareness that it raises. I don't know how many of our audience uh, would know that India, unfortunately, despite all the progress, still contributes more than 20% of total um, newborn deaths in the world every year. Uh, so things like that. Uh, and I think so IGD is not only, uh, you know, trying to raise funds, but also raise awareness especially among the uh, Indian diaspora. So that's what excites me about um, IGT. Wonderful. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nishant, for those thoughts. And uh, may I now turn to uh, Kamal, if you'd like to give us a perspective from Atri about your organization and uh, your thoughts about India Giving Day. Well, uh, thank you, Sumani. And uh, I'm really very happy to participate in this uh, webinar. And... Uh, in a very illustrious, uh, I would say, company. Uh, our work has always been inspired by Segal Foundation, uh, which we regard as a, our sister organization. And of course, America India Foundation is a very well-known organization doing uh, outstanding work. ATRI USA is a 501c3 organization registered in, in, in the US to support primarily ATRI India. ATRI India was founded 25 years ago in Bangalore. Uh, we are based in Bangalore, uh, but we have five community conservation centers throughout India. And more importantly, our staff and students work throughout India. We have a very unique institutional model, an academic center that generates interdisciplinary knowledge that feeds into policy. So we have a center for policy design linked to our academic center. And this knowledge, and this knowledge is primarily on environmental issues, that is our main concern. 
environment and the human well-being. Then this knowledge feeds downstream to our Center for Social Environmental Innovation that works at the grassroots level. Linked to the academy, linked to the academic centers is our academy, which anchors our master's program in conservation science and PhD program in conservation and sustainability. The degree is given by Manipal University, but our faculty recruit students. They offer courses to the students. They guide the students. And the sole purpose of the academy is to, gener to generate a new breed of leaders to meet India's environmental challenges. The Academy also anchors our K through 12 educational program, which is based, which is the, the, the focus of this program is environmental education, nature education, and so on and so forth. And so the three areas which we work on are biodiversity and ecosystem services. We are particularly concerned about the decline in biodiversity and ecosystem services and the impact of the, this decline on human well-being. Climate change is another area of focus. And then the third area is water. And our goal is to see that sustainable development in India is socially just and doesn't leave behind the marginalized community and doesn't occur at the expense of natural assets. Because ultimately, if we lose the natural assets and we are losing it at a very fast rate, anything we do, anything we do really has very little relevance. So our livelihoods program then is in the context of climate change and decline of ecosystem services. As Jay mentioned, water is a major issue. The loss of soil fertility is a major issue. So you work, we work with marginalized farmers, small land holders in areas that are rich in biodiversity on issues such as climate resilient agriculture, how to enhance biodiversity both below ground and above ground so that we can sustain agricultural ecosystems in the long run. So then, in a sense, our community conservation centers are embedded in very large landscapes. And the question is, the question we are addressing is, how do we sustain these landscapes for many, many needs of the society? the needs of the urban sector, the needs of the rural sector, the needs of the nature. Nature needs to be sustained. Nature needs to be nurtured. And how do we mitigate climate change and other environmental disasters we are facing? We are here in the IGD. Uh, uh, just it is a big privilege to be a part of this uh, very outstanding organizations. And our goal, I think, in IGD is to highlight the link between human well-being and the health of the environment and the health of our planet. And uh, we are here to learn about other organizations, to collaborate with other organizations, and to express our solidarity with many causes many, many worthy causes that are being pursued by other organizations. Wonderful. Um, thank you for that. And just from the Health Page perspective, um, you know, we have two specific programs under our livelihoods, um, sort of overall uh, segment of, of interventions. One is uh, Health Page has really pioneered the concept of the elder self-help group, which I think, Nishant, you might relate to because I know you all work with AIF on self women's self-help groups, perhaps. So this is sort of a different concept, uh, but it's very much rooted in, you know, self-resilience and sort of this community endeavor around 
uh, elder empowerment and help page has created over 8000 elder self help groups that really empowering uh, 100000 elders in rural india and they really provide a sense of you know financial inclusion we've included digital inclusion recently as well um but really to provide that sense of dignity and empowerment to elders that are no longer able to work in sort of the formal workforce as it is we are looking at 138 million elders in india 90% are outside of the formal organized sector and once people are in that age group where they're not able to perhaps participate as you know as uh, they used to when they were more able bodied etc people start to look at them as a burden on the society on the community so this platform of elder self help groups has really provided the sense of dignity and empowerment and for elders to be able to come together for locally contextual relevant sources of income generation um so that is one intervention that help page is very proud to um to really work on and the second is we have a geriatric skills training program uh, more addressed to the issue of this skills gap that we find in india with a huge swath of the young people uh, that need livelihoods and employment and yet there's you know growing number of elderly that will require caregiving again a huge burden of that tends to fa fall on women and um, you know sort of families etc and how do we mitigate those and creating a pool of uh, skilled caregivers is a good way to address that and that's another area help page has been working in uh, so i think i love that you know each of us is addressing very different um, sort of challenges all related to livelihoods um, but coming back to sort of this, uh, you know, the issue of labor force participation, let me, Nishan, start with you there, um, because you, that's not something you mentioned. And I was just curious on, you know, some of the cultural norms around women's participation, uh, especially uh, how are you, in terms of your methodology of looking at livelihoods, how are you trying to address some of this? And, you know, if you're able to speak to the education or awareness, et cetera, that perhaps has to go along with it. But anything that you'd like to speak to in terms of your methodology uh, for uh, fostering livelihoods for disabled, for marginalized young people, etc. Absolutely. And, but before I do that, let me kind of just kind of speak to geriatric care model that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, on March 8th, which is in a few days, which is also the International Women's Day, we are organizing uh, a conference on, uh, it's a virtual conference, um, on care economy which is uh, such an important part of what we are talking about, uh, especially when it comes to women's participation in the workforce. Uh, lack of care infrastructure is, is a big reason. There are lots of other reasons, um, but lack of care infrastructure and women uh, disproportionately bear the burden of care, not just for child care, but also elderly care, care for the sick and, and so on. And so how do we make sure that we strengthen that infrastructure, which enables women to join uh, the workforce uh, in large numbers in India, right? So I invite all everybody to join in. Um, we'll be sharing the details on social media and our, on our website soon. Um, and we have a fantastic uh, lineup of speakers uh, in collaboration with USISPF, uh, the Embassy of India in DC, uh, Indra Nui is the headline speaker and so on, right? But coming back to your question, uh, I think you talked about self-help groups. We have several years of experience of developing uh, women's uh, enterprises. And now we feel that, um, you know, there is a big opportunity uh, for all of us, I guess, um, to leverage the SHG infrastructure that exists in the country. There are millions and millions of SHGs which were born out of the microfinance movement some 20 years back. Many of them, and when I say many, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of SHGs, uh, are doing very well, uh, but they are doing what they're doing, which is just operating as as, a, as an as an SHG, which is just, you know kind of savings and a little bit of investment and things like that. And with governments, uh, this is Government of India's uh, focus on Startup India and so on, there is an opportunity for us to help these SHGs uh, graduate to uh, an enterprise uh, model. Uh, I was in fact in India uh, for two weeks and I met lots of women uh, in, for example, in the state of uh, Madhya Pradesh who are organized as, as SHGs and are actually doing quite well 
but just the hunger and the ambition to do more and um, become employment generators rather than employment seekers. I think that is a very, very important um, kind of opportunity and energy that we want to tap into. And so a lot of our work now on um, women's economic empowerment is focused on that part. The other part within that is how do we um, use all this work to contribute to India's journey towards net zero in 2017. Uh, so green jobs, green livelihoods is a major um, area uh, which is emerging within our livelihoods work. And the intersection of women's economic empowerment and climate resilience is a very, very uh, um, interesting, very uh, uh, exciting area uh, that we are looking at uh, in our livelihoods work. So we have, for example, signed up um, a partnership with India's largest uh, two-wheeler EV company, Hero Electric, where we are training women to become EV mechanics. Now, as we all know, the automobile sector, if you walk on the streets of India, you will see lots of lots and lots of mini garages, but they're all predominantly uh, male owned. And so auto mechanics are kind of mostly all of them, pretty much men, right? But the EV engine is completely different to the four, um, you know, the combustible engine. And so there is an opportunity for women uh, to get involved uh, in the sector. And that's what we are tapping into. Uh, and so, and and there are lots of other examples. I know we are we don't have time to talk talk about everything, but these are the kind of opportunities that we are tapping into in terms of our um, uh, you know uh, model of generating uh, livelihoods based on the experience that we have had, based on what else is happening in the economy, based on what the government's priorities are. Uh, and based on you know what where we we think we can leverage private sector partnerships and resources. Great. Um, so coming back to the issue on sort of the agricultural sustainability and uh, Jay, you spoke about uh, that being you know sort of the core of all our, what Segal Foundation does as well. Um, what is sort of like your major methodology? Again, the question of the awareness and education and, you know, receptivity to sort of the upcoming challenges that we have on sustainability and how do you impart that uh, through your methodology that you're trying to tackle the livelihoods question? So uh, anything that you wanted to add uh, on that front? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks. Um, I think the, our methodology is again, uh, very much a bottom up methodology, uh, working with the uh, farmers, understanding what type of difficulties they're facing, what where the where the um, especially with the women farmers, you know, particularly focus on women farmers, you talk about women participation, looking at where the, the main thing we realize is the lack of knowledge on appropriate sustainable agriculture practices. So when we talk about they are not aware of the soil con composition, uh, con uh, how the soil uh, impacts the, uh, the farming practices. Uh, so we do good, we put a lot of stress on the soil testing uh, in and in, in, uh, giving the information about what type of micronutrients are actually missing in the soils. Now, the thing is that uh, our methodology is not going and working with every every, uh, every all the farmers we do a sampling with uh, demonstrations and we show the farmers how they their regular interventions versus our interventions with control plots versus intervention plots work and then do a lot of uh, farmer visit farmer visits to those lots to see what the difference uh, the uh, the intervention villages uh, internet intervention plots can make in this so the soil testing working with the farmers on education education on the soil testing working with the farmers on quality of seed they purchase because farmers do spend a lot of money on the seed and fertilizers and all those things but they don't pay much attention to the below the soil solution uh, dr baba also talked about that but the but we put a lot of emphasis on those particular products. and then the, by many of the farmers especially the women farmers tend to buy a seed which is uh, what they call open seed and spurious seed and where the, the money is spent but there's growth is very minimal or none at the end and so we work on educating the uh, farmers on those particular those type of practices where they pay attention to the 
So then the water con conservation, many of the farmers actually in the rainy season, of course, uh, wherever the rain is there, the farm, uh, farmers uh, have the water to grow. But on the uh, on the uh, rubby, rubby, what they call the dry season, there's farmers end up, many of the farmers end up buying the water, uh, but then the use of the water is very, uh, very primitive as a matter of fact, because they do flood irrigation, because as you can see in today's world, flood irrigation is very, very lot of waste of water in that particular aspect. So we educate the farmers on drip irrigation, sprinkler irrigation, which, whichever way they can conserve the water and still get good crop at the end of the day so th those are the those are the key aspects of working and and we particularly look at one solution doesn't fit all let's let's put it that way every village every uh, location has a different uh, situation different aspects of we have areas where the uh, soils are highly saline soils and you have to really devise a solution for those farmers on this uh, how do you work with the saline crop saline uh, res, uh, res, uh, what do you call these tolerant crops in those particular areas and how do you how are you able to use the, even the saline water to water the crops in that, in that. so there, so there's a there's that particular element that comes in one of the biggest thing that uh, uh, that we, uh, as I said, you talked about women empowerment. The uh, we work on the uh, kitchen garden with the with the women farmers uh, throughout our areas, and uh, we have seen over the years these women have are now able to get good crops from the very effective kitchen gardens they work on, and and they are able to, in addition to having the self nutrition for their families, they are also able to sell some of this to their neighbors and to uh, to others in, in the region. So that has been a very effective uh, program in along with the working on the farmers on the um, laser leveling to effective use of water with the drip irrigation and the and, and how to conserve the water at the ground. And then we have also worked quite a bit on effective use of fertilizers, pesticides, because farmer wants to protect that crop as whatever it takes. But in that process, they, they um, misuse or they overuse the fertilizer because they're mostly dependent on the the uh, the uh, the shopkeeper to give that knowledge but they don't have that knowledge of what type of how much fertilizer how much the pesticides they need to use uh, to protect their protect their crops so we do educate the farmers on those particular aspects to our uh, agriculture education systems that we have we protect in the village through vill uh, village level women leadership groups that that's one thing that we uh, work on every village that we create with women leadership groups in the villages where a lot of this knowledge are given to the women farmers in that particular aspect. Uh, just to, uh, we, uh, on the livelihoods with the women, we also work on life skills education where we, the, I think the model has been used by sewing and stitching and, and giving those type of um, skills uh, to the farmers where we have seen women open up their own uh, sewing and stitching shops, their beauty parlors in, in the rural communities to have this extra earning coming from those particular aspects. And of course, in the schools, we work quite a bit with the young girls because women empowerment starts at a very, very young age where they digital literacy, proper schools, uh, government schools, where these, uh, the, these, uh, these girls go and they are more educated uh, for the for their for the future so that's those are the some some of the things particular things that we as we address in that particular aspect right um Kamal any think from you know from Atri's perspective on the methodology and how do you also measure impact of your interventions uh, in terms of those specific methodologies that your organization has has developed would love to hear from you yeah, just uh, as Jay mentioned, our methodology is also very much knowledge-based and science-based. We are interested in seeing what works, what doesn't work. And what doesn't work, what are the reasons that it doesn't work? And the approach is very different. It's not the approach that we know the solution and we are going to go and implement that solution. In terms of designing the project, you know, there is co-ideation of the project. There is co-design of the project. There is co 
co-generation of the knowledge. Knowledge is co-created with the stakeholders on the ground. And since we partly view this as a scientific challenge, you know, we have built in evaluation and monitoring plans. How are we going to measure our progress? In much of the work that is going on in the NGO sector, you know, we don't often report on the failures. And actually the failures are one which provide you more knowledge in terms of how to do things better next time. So there is a very strong an evaluation and monitoring component. And finally, I should say, we measure progress, impact, you mentioned, along three dimensions, economic dimension, social dimension, and environmental dimension. Very often we forget that any progress we make, there are always trade-offs. We might be able to enhance productivity, but there might be a trade-off in terms of other aspects of the environment. So we have to keep that in mind. And again, as I mentioned earlier, our approach is we, we look at the livelihoods in the context of environmental issues mm -hmm. in terms of climate change mitigation. And I'll give you a, one specific example again, uh, related to the environment. For example, we have worked in Billigari Rangan Hills for a number of years where this invasive species, Lantana camara, has taken over the forest. This invasive species that came from South America to India has taken over vast areas, thousands of square kilometers of Indian forest and the understory it has spread. So we work with a local communities to use lantana for furniture making and develop those skills, removing lantana from the forest and converting into something very useful, something inexpensive, something that enhanced the income of the local communities by many, many factors. So there are co-benefits in terms of not only incomes, but co-benefits in terms of the environment. So st staying on that theme of you know, sustainability and climate change, since that's uh, uh, very core to, um, at least especially for the Seigel Foundation and Atri, at, at least I'm getting the sense that's very core to what you all do. Um, but for HelpAge as well, you know, through the elder self-help groups, which are very much rooted in the rural communities, they're completely driven by the elders, so it says very much about that their empowerment and how they feel about uh, you know what livelihoods make the most sense and that are the most environmentally suitable to where they are. Um, so that's very much a part of all of the sort of livelihood activities that they undertake. Uh, so in terms of sustainability, that's been an important uh, issue for us. So uh, you know, Jay, when you mentioned about kitchen gardens, etc., huge project for uh, a lot of elder self-help groups and they're taking a vermicomposting and organic farming, uh, trying to minimize use of fertilizers and pesticides, et cetera, when, you know, with fruit planting and things that elders are undertaking. Uh, and that's something that's knowledge that's also being passed on to the younger generations on how to live within your means and, you know, in a sustainable way with local resources and respect for environment, et cetera. Um, so Nishant, sorry, uh, unless anybody else wanted to weigh in, wanted to hear from Nishant on how climate change and sustainability might be factoring into your work as well. Absolutely, yeah. I think I've already touched upon it. Um, as I said, uh, green jobs and green livelihoods is emerging as a major area, major area of focus for AIF. Um, you know, environmental sustainability was always a cross-cutting issue across all our program portfolio. So gen so health, education, and livelihoods are like the three pillars. And then you have gender justice and environmental sustainability as two cross-cutting issues. But over the last um, two to three years, we have become much more intentional about our role or the role that we think we can play in um, 
the transition that India is going through in terms of you know um, uh, the, the 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 green um, greening of the economy, so to say, right? And of course, a lot of work is happening on how do we make. I mean, we all know that you know poor people are disproportionately affected by climate change in many different ways, um, which are all of us are aware of. Um, and how do we make sure that we build their resilience to climate change? Uh, but equally importantly, importantly, and it's actually very exciting, uh, we are looking at how we can leverage all the action that is happening on climate change, as in the climate action work and all the investment that is going on. How do we leverage that to eradicate poverty completely? Um, so uh, otherwise, what happens, uh, I guess, globally, not just in India, is that a lot of this work will happen um, at certain levels and will exclude poor people. And what we are trying to do, leveraging our existing program work, is to make sure that poor people benefit from all the climate action work that is happening. Uh, so there are kind of two, it's a two-pronged kind of approach uh, that we are trying to take and the example I was mentioning before on how do we increase uh, women's uh, employability within the automobile sector, leveraging the transition uh, to EV uh, is one uh, such example. Uh, the other uh, you know, example is we are working with uh, Unilever in India on how do we um, use uh, cow dung to make logs which can be sold so as we all know, women in India, in rural areas, use cow dung to make these, um, you know, I don't know what they call in English, but basically for Patties. food. Yeah. yeah, things like that, right? But how do you do it as an enterprise? Um, you know, nobody goes and sells these things to anyone, right? They, they're all made for self-consumption. But if you make locks, you can sell it in markets, not just in the local market, but in the national market. And so there is an opportunity of looking at all this work that is happening on environmental sustainability for and use it for poverty uh, uh, reduction as well. There are lots of other uh, things that we are uh, doing in terms of leveraging uh, this, especially, as I said, at the confluence of climate change and women's economic empowerment. There is a very, very important um, part of it. I know this webinar is focused on livelihoods, but I, I do want to touch upon a uh, certain part of work that we do under our education work, since you asked about uh, sustainability. Uh, you know, climate change is also something which is going to be an intergenerational issue, uh, not, you know, just like the gender justice work, right? You can't uh, solve the gender issue based on a three-year project, right? How do you change the attitude towards women and girls through a three-year project? It's the same thing in climate. It's going to be multi-decade work, and therefore, it is very important to make the children of today aware of sustainability issues and become more responsible citizens going forward. Unless we develop agency within children to um, act on climate, uh, I think you know it will not be sustainable. And therefore, we are, therefore, we are leveraging our education work to create awareness on recycling, reuse, um, all kinds of. Uh, sustainability issues uh, within the thousands and thousands of government schools that we work uh, in every year. And so it's a kind of a climate is kind of an all encompassing issue, uh, which and we are using um, uh, that lens to look at our education, health and livelihoods work and see where we can contribute to the climate action that is happening in India. Yeah, and all encompassing, but also I think very much an inter, you know, intersecting with so many different issues. And like you said, it will be over decades of years of work that will uh, we need to be put in to really tackle the you know climate and sustainability challenge. So I know so far we've been talking about sort of also macro trends, but I'd love to also drill down as we're sort of winding down on our time here on you know individual uh, case studies of impact because I think that really. Uh, resonates with folks that might be listening to this. Um, so uh, Kamal would love to start with you with, uh, if you have an example of a person that, uh, you know, has come in contact with Atri's work and how their lives might have been impacted, touched or transformed, uh, if you will, by your organization's uh, intervention. 
Yeah, <clears throat> we are working with uh, several communities, uh, as I said, in many parts of India, but I'll give you just one example from Biligari Rangan Hills, where uh, the indigenous group Soligas, uh, which number uh, several thousand, we have been working with them for almost 10 or 15 years. And uh, our work on livelihoods there has, as I centered around uh, the harvest of non-timber forest products uh, where we have diversified livelihoods so that they can get more income, but at, on a sustainable basis, the sustainable harvest of honey and other non-timber forest products. But more importantly, we have examined uh, the issues there in terms of the land rights. Uh, we have worked with them uh, on Forest Rights Act, which was enacted in 2006. There are 100 million people affected by Forest Rights Act in India, but there are very, very few examples of people getting those rights. Law is something, but practice is another thing. And we have worked with the thousands uh, of soligas to make sure that the forest rights bill is in, enacted in that region so they have the rights and the right that right is very important that's in a way is the right to land right to the livelihoods and so uh, that's one example of a very very integrated program that has affected thousands of people not only in increasing their incomes but in securing their fundamental rights great um jay did you want to talk about a specific example um <laughs> Yeah, thanks. I, I think the um, it is it, it, it becomes a little bit difficult to point pinpoint one example as such to uh, to point out, but because you work, uh, most all of our organization work with the millions of people. I mean, Sego Foundation uh, now is in. Uh, in uh, 12 states working in, on 17, 1800 villages uh, and uh, out of four or five million people, on, you know. So it's very difficult to just pinpoint one, some of the examples, but I think on a larger scale, um, uh, we have seen a tremendous impact on the farmer producer organizations that, that the Sega Foundation has uh, impacted in, 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 the, in the communities. Um, and of course, I, I mentioned earlier as well, our women leadership groups are, uh, to have a, is a tremendous success uh, in the in in the rural communities where the uh, uh, I think the, the, this kind of relates to uh, uh, your your aspect is that uh, a lot of the young people who are going away from the agriculture mm -hmm. in the rural communities and a lot of the elder people are ending ending up in the community in the in uh, with the agriculture and as as the metros are taking over many of the agricultural land, the productive, productive overall productivity is squeezing. Mm -hmm. So the target for us is to create as much productivity as possible for this, those uh, leftover uh, uh, villages. And I think the, the our our overall uh, farmer community has been tremendously impacted by the. Of course, I, I would like to, like to point out the the programs that we brought in 20 years ago at that particular time it did not make a lot of sense to the farmers and they would not they were not very accepting to it but now you go back to those uh, those villages and see the success and the impact of the same programs now in those villages is, is tremendous i think this so that creates a lot of success with the farmers uh, on on the on the agriculture and so it examples but i think there are many examples of where the uh, the impact has been tremendous with the communities because for us uh, at the sego foundation if something does not make an impact we will not get into those particular aspects so we are very focused on uh, on bringing the impact in whatever we do um, and and women empowerment and uh, climate change are absolutely cross-cutting themes uh, for our organization so right. Um, Nishant, any specific examples or uh, beneficiaries that you, you might want to talk about? Absolutely. Thank you for including this question, <laughs> Samani, <laughs> because, you know, as much as we uh, try and work at very large scale and at a kind of ecosystem level, yeah. um, it's these individual stories that kind of energize and inspire us. We are at the end of the day, we are sitting, you know, 
thousands and thousands of kilometers away from uh, the place that we are discussing, right? Yeah. Um, so I had, I as I said, I was in India for a couple of weeks and I had the opportunity to travel around from Jharkhand to uh, Telangana, to Madhya Pradesh and uh, you know small towns, villages, big cities and met a lot of communities that we serve. And one story that kind of uh, comes to my mind is that of a street vendor um, named Mohammed Siraz. Uh, he is a street vendor and he sells bangles to earn his livelihoods on the street of old city of Hyderabad. And uh, this is a story from our uh, from a new project that we conceptualized and designed uh, in the aftermath of the first wave of COVID. So somewhere around October, November in uh, 2020. And the project is called On to Prerna. Prerna is a Hindi word that, that means inspiration. And the whole idea was, how can we help uh, street vendors of India uh, to rebuild, revive their businesses, which have had been completely destroyed by COVID-induced lockdowns. If you remember, India had one of the longest lockdowns of, you know, globally, fall countries uh, in the first wave. And obviously, we are talking about people who derive their livelihoods from the streets, literally. Uh, and, you know, and they derive their income on a daily basis. So when there is nothing happening on the streets for weeks and weeks and weeks, these businesses get completely destroyed. They don't have the savings or the collaterals to kind of really reinvest, right? So that's where we um, designed this program called Entrepreneur. And the whole idea is to um, available is to make three things available to the street vendors. The first one is the working capital loan, uh, which is absolutely important to restock and kind of just uh, start the business all over again. The second one is to use this opportunity to uh, include them in the digital economy. They have been excluded so far from the digital um, uh, India push, uh, not just on the payment side, but also on the repayment side. And the third one is market linkages, but again, kind of digital e-commerce kind of market linkages. And, uh, and you know, these the working capital loans that I'm talking about uh, are not provided by AIF, they are provided by commercial banks. So we are leveraging a uh, government of India a scheme called PM Swanidhi and getting these um, lots and lots of banks, public sector banks, private sector banks to give these loans. Um, our goal is uh, to serve 1 million street vendors across 25 cities of India. We are currently working with 750,000 uh, street vendors. A $4 investment from AIF is unlocking $150 to $200 of working capital loans from the commercial banks and leading to $1,000 of incremental income enhancement for these street vendors. So it's a 250x return on the philanthropic capital. And so Mohammed Siraj, his uh, you know business again got completely disrupted uh, because of covid induced lockdown he was not able to obviously sell the bangles and feed his family um, and he was not able to basically go back uh, when the lockdown was lifted so that's where team aif came in and made this loan available to him uh, it started with 10000 rupees and which he you know paid back in time uh, and then he went for a 20,000 uh, rupee loan. And when I met him just last week, he has already taken a 50,000 rupee loan. So he has already gone through three cycles of um, working capital loans, using it to increase his business and employ more people and things like that. And that is the energy, the ambition, the drive that I was talking about uh, in India. You know, sometimes we feel that people living in poverty don't have that drive. But that is not true. They just need an opportunity, right? And that's what I think our job is. Our job is to provide that opportunity to them. They will take care of the rest of the things. So the, the story of Mohammed Siraj, who is a person with disability, uh, was so heartwarming and so energizing for me. And I've just come back with this, you know, supercharged, uh, motivated uh, myself, uh, who is going to work even harder uh, to serve more people. It's a great, uh, great example um, from from all of you. But also from uh, Health Pages perspective, you know, we uh, I think a lot of people tend to not consider elders when we're talking about sort of the developmental imperatives around India. I don't think it sort of registers. Um, so which is why for us, this is a great way to sort of shine attention on, on this issue. But 
the elder self help group i find is a great way to really also show that people are capable of lifelong learning and of like nishan said about being provided an opportunity and then really running with it so we've had lots of examples but one uh, lady by the name of kanchan devi who's 68 years old in supal in bihar who came in contact with the elder self help group she was a widow and uh, had lost her husband didn't have much in terms of sort of a you know regular source of livelihood and she uh, was given seed money by the elder self help group and then she purchased a sewing machine grew her work on the sewing side and purchased two and then three uh, i believe there are at five uh, sewing machines for this small group that she has and there's three elderly women two widows and one of their sons is sort of attached to this small micro business and you know it's really the multiplier effect of this one intervention and what it can lead to in terms of productivity gains but also enhanced incomes and empowerment and dignity for so many people and i think all people sometimes need is a little little bit of a help and they're more than willing to run with it and i think we all see that hopefully in each of our work and interventions um so i know we're sort of at the end of our time here but any last thoughts on india giving day what you think of as a metric of success if you have one i uh, would love to invite any thoughts so jay did you want to uh, before we wrap up uh, any final thoughts on india giving day oh that's a tough one um i think i think since it's the inaugural year i think it's the uh, uh success uh, anything we do coming together is is the success i think yeah. that's that is the main thing um I, w- i said it earlier i think we will learn a lot uh we'll make modifications will change but i think this is uh, it, it is it is only has a way to go up i don't yeah. think we will crash out of it in a year so that's my personal feeling i think it's i think it's uh, we are set set ourselves up for quite a success because there's so much um uh being talked about uh it's so much word is out i mean so much effort has gone in and i don't think anybody is ready to just give it up after one year so i i see a i see a growth going forward I, that's what my i would say wonderful kamal any final thoughts from you yes uh, i think we we face tremendous problems education livelihoods health we have discussed these problems and i think we have great opportunity we have great opportunity to examine all these issues pressing issues in the context of kind of environmental sustainability i think that should be the lens within that lens there is a lot of amplitude to examine all the issues we face and thereby we should focus on co benefits whether we are talking about health livelihoods and others that not only we make progress in these areas but also we take care of our planet that ultimately sustains all human endeavors absolutely nishant yeah final thoughts from you yeah uh, thank you first of all thank you sumani for bringing us together thank you jay and kamal uh for allowing me to join uh this webinar a few years back there was a study done i think by dalberg which said that if indian american households gave at the same level as the average american households uh, and only 40% of that gave uh, you know went to india it will be 1.2 billion dollars per year which is 100 times the official development assistance from the us to india so you know sometimes we feel that oh what 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 you know what my 10 dollars 20 dollars 50 dollars is going to do but i think um, you know pull together um, we are capable of uh, uh, you know um, raising resources that can address many of the challenges that we have talked about in this webinar uh, i think i'm very happy and excited about uh, india giving day as jay said this is just the beginning this is this the first year um, and we're going to learn a lot i urge all um the viewers to go on the ipa website uh, to learn more about all the uh, member organizations and their work there's much more on the website than what we have managed to to <laughs> talk about in this 60 minutes and just engage i think engagement is very very important in 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 ways that makes sense to you yeah absolutely and i think just the fact that we're all gathered here 
uh, in this sort of spirit of collaboration, very much, I think, our metric of success and to be able to leverage each of our issues and bring visibility to the many myriad but interlinked issues, whether it's climate, <laughs> sustainability, healthcare, there's just so much overlap um, in, in all of these developmental imperatives. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, www.indiagivingday.org. And I hope uh, viewers will uh, will take a look and uh, really galvanize uh, you know, their friends, their community members to give to India in whatever way, Nishant, as Nishant said, that makes sense. So with that, thank you so much to every one of you for taking the time to participate today. And uh, good luck as we uh, gear towards uh, the final leg, uh, lap of uh, India Giving Day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Take Thank care. You. Thanks. That's, that's what she said.